right, thank you. We, uh, we weren't sure who was going to show up at uh, 4.30 at the end of the conference, at the end of a very long, wonderful two days. I certainly have had a great time, and I hope that all of you have as well. Um, I'm going to just jump right in. These folks know how to talk about themselves. Uh, it's very exciting for me whenever we work with people from traditional uh, markets and how they see the space. And so these are the most interesting conversations from my perspective. So Doug, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. Doug Schwenk, uh, CEO of Digital Asset Research. Uh, we are a market data provider uh, bridging crypto asset uh, market data into both traditional um, uh, financial services and into crypto markets and, and do that um, with a real focus on institutional quality. Kristen? Hi. Kristen Mirzwa. I'm the head of Digital Asset Indexes for FTSE Russell and we're a division of the London Stock Exchange and we've actually been partnered with Doug since 2019 officially and we probably started talking to you in 2018 about utilizing his institutional quality data in our indices. That's awesome. It's fantastic. Um, so it's not exactly completely breaking news because Doug was on a television feed a little bit earlier today to talk about our relationship, but it is somewhat breaking news. So, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what we're announcing today with respect to Chainlink and uh, DAR? Yeah, we're super excited about it. Um, we are providing pricing data on a thousand fungible crypto assets, um, 400 millisecond resolution, uh, so if you need prices in smart contracts around uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and 998 others, uh, you can rely on the highest quality price. We take those prices through a, a rigorous cleaning and vetting process to make sure it's real economic information, real buyers, real sellers, uh, so it's a price that you can rely on. How do you deal with uh, things where there's not that much liquidity and perhaps there's a lot of volatility there? Is there any special sauce you have to apply when it comes to that side of it? It's a, it's a huge problem. Um, we spend a lot of time scrounging the earth for liquidity, and, and today we take data from over 450 exchanges oh, wow. um, and other sources, uh, OTC desks, et cetera, um, looking for ways to help price some of these assets. Uh, okay. In some cases, they just don't trade, trade very often. Volatility is just baked in. I think that's a, um, you know, if you're in crypto markets, get ready for volatility. Um, but with the, the assets that we're pricing here, uh, the 1,000 assets, there is generally pretty good liquidity in most of those, enough to have a price on that 400 millisecond basis that, that is, is generally up with the market. Amazing. So digital asset research is right in the name. Digital assets is obviously what you guys do. It makes sense why uh, you're excited about this space. LSIG's been around a little bit longer than digital assets, you know, by about 100 years. <laughs> or so. Yeah. so I'd love to learn a little bit more about uh, why, what do you guys think about Web3? Why are you in Web3? Why do you come to conferences like this? Why are we buddies with you? What do you see the future in this space? Yeah, so um, the London Stock Exchange really thinks about our role is to um, kind of be an infrastructure supplier for the life cycle of a trade. So we have pillars and business units that take care of all different parts of that trade life cycle. Um, but there's four areas that maybe I could just share that we're pretty advanced in thinking about how do we either integrate digital asset technology into what we're already doing or build something new. Um, an easy one that I just mentioned, of course, is indexing. And why that's easy is because we're really just reporting what's going on in the marketplace. And you can imagine the London Stock Exchange is a very conservative institution. So... Um, coming in with indexes feels like what we always do. We're just saying, hey, this is what happened in the market. This is a good benchmark for you to use. We're, we're not advising anyone on what to do or, or trade or anything. Um, so that's easy, indexes, and we can come back to that later. Um, but other areas of our business where we're thinking about using blockchain technology, of course, is post-trade and just thinking about how do you settle trades and not have to wait for three days? Is there a better way to use a blockchain to do that or tokenize? Um, so post-trade is a huge focus for us. Um, we also bought a exchange called Tora um, for their order management system, and they... <clears throat> 
already use digital, or they're already allowing digital asset trading to happen on that venue. Um, and then last but not least is really thinking about a lot of our trusted data that we already have in house and getting that on chain. And that's how we all ended up here together. Um, and some examples of that would be things like WM Reuters FX rates. And we certainly have tons of clients who are thinking like, hey, I want a smart tr contract to happen, but it needs that data input that's not native to the chain, and we need to get it on chain so those decisions can be made. So, which is my favorite question of all time, is why, what are the advantages of moving that on chain? Clearly it exists today. It's been operative for forever. Um, yet people still see there's genuine advantage to, to moving that on chain. So, so how do you answer that question? Why do they want to move it on chain? Uh, speed, <laughs> Comes speed is the number one thing. Um, also, like I don't know if the audience really here today has worked with traditional data providers in the, um, the sense where we're still delivering things uh, through FTP and CSV files. You know, things are taking a long time to get pushed out there, so speed would be huge. Um, you know, and I think another thing is our business model often is subscription-based, so you would pay us a flat fee up front. If you start having data that's on-chain and people call to that data, then perhaps you could just use the data on a case-by-case -case or usage basis rather than paying for something that you're like, I don't know if I'm really going to use this all year or not. So commercially, it makes sense for our clients, too. Is that disruptive in a bad way, in a good way? I mean, because like, there's, a, there's a traditional business that's built there around those subscription payments, yeah. so is that, that's a good, that's a good thing? Yeah, I think so, um, because we want our clients to be happy with what, you know, data we're providing them, and they don't want to feel like, hey, I'm going to cancel the whole service because I didn't use it enough. Um, and uh, things that we're working through with your teams when we think about putting data on chain are, okay, well, we still need to have a contractual relationship with the end user of that data, um, you know, and make sure that that's all put in place, which you can do, you know, so we've figured those kinds of things out. Yeah. Is that an issue you guys are stressed out at all on uh, at digital asset? The notion of writing things in a public forum or in a public chain, is that, uh, is there any concerns that that uh, has a, gonna have a downstream effects, makes it more difficult to resell that data? Or that's something you hear often. Mm -hmm. Traditional companies are like, well, wait a second. Why would I do this in a public space? You know, I've been, I'm so used to my, my, my walls. And uh, how do you feel about that? I think it's something when you first think about the idea of blockchain and everything should be public and everything should be auditable and, and that data should be there. Um, you have to get your you have to wrap your head around what is going to happen to your business model, your commercial model. I think we don't stress about that at all um, because we think that the delivery over blockchain will be a sort of plumbing and pipes that puts it in the hands of lots more users. And these users that are our customers are going to be compliant users. They're going to, they're going to sign a license agreement or agree to terms, and they're going to pay their bill, and, and we're not too worried about that. A lot of them are regulated anyway. Yeah. They can't go stealing data, um, uh, not for very long anyway. Uh, so we, we don't feel bad about that, but we think that by putting it out there and making it more accessible, uh, people are more likely to consume that data, and, and that should, you know, removing that friction should give us more customers in the end. Great. So one of the things that I think we're most excited about at Chainlink, and I know you guys are excited about it as well, is this notion of, I mean, so DeFi is, is crypto trading and basically crypto options happening on chain. But there's really so much more that can be done, both in traditional equities. We can move traditional equity trading on chain. We can do lots of different things on chain. I know you've got some new data sets that, are, that, that can help encourage that. I know you've got some great ideas about new data sets that can help encourage that kind of trading. So I thought maybe we would just go and finish off with, with what your thoughts are on what we should be doing uh, to make derivatives even easier. You want to start us off, Kristen? Can we start? OK. So this is like a, a project that we started looking at when building new digital asset indices. So I've got about 50 some odd assets in our eligible universe that's gone through screening that Doug's team does. Um, but once you've got this universe, if I think about regular equity indices, I have to apply corporate actions. And I need to do that when they get announced and when they come through. And that may not be exactly at rebalance state. So that things happen intra-rebalance. 
Um, in dig the digital asset world, because these are not primarily listed securities, there's no single source for, hey, the protocol's gonna do a hard fork tomorrow. It's not that easy to get that information, and what Doug's team does is put together, you know, they source these this data from GitHub, from chat rooms, from Twitter, um, and just try to pull it together to figure out, okay, what's happening on the protocol? Um, is this meaningful to someone like myself who's building indices off the back of the data, and do I need to implement anything with that data? Um, okay, so we know this is already hard. So <laughs> Doug has this data, but then I have to get it from the world of DAR into the world of FTSE Russell. And instead of doing everything the old way, we're trying to think about, okay, where do we need to be five years from now? I don't wanna just rebuild like I did something 15 years ago. So of course we're thinking, if he gets is a node operator and uses Chainlink to get this data up into an oracle, I'd rather map all my systems to pick up the data from this oracle. And hopefully the oracle organizes the data better than a link from Twitter, because that's very hard to use in an algo. Um, and it's kind of a bare minimum requirement. Yeah. I, think, I think we can handle that. I think we've got some smart people in the room who can make yeah. that happen for you. So, and just all of that, I, I mean, you're probably like, why are you so excited about this? Because this is the stuff that's really hard for indexers, and it really matters. When you've got billions, if not trillions, tracking some sort of index that you've put out there, you cannot afford to get this wrong. And I don't want to implement data late. You know, everyone's looking, when, why, why are you guys doing this 16 weeks later, right? Like, we need to be as fast as the market. Yeah. Um, so this is an infrastructure problem that can be solved on-chain, most likely better than in a traditional method. Yeah, I don't think that people understand exactly how much data is behind the scenes in traditional markets. If you really want to build real risk models, if you want to build real options and derivatives markets, like all the information you need at the exit of the day, when splits happen, and of course it's a little different in crypto with when, when other events are going to happen. Mm -hmm. So how do you go and get on and scrape all that data and all that work from, I can't imagine, do you have a thousand people on your team? I mean, I mean how does it all work? How do you make that, how do you make that happen? Well, we have a kind of two-fold approach, and, and we've been um, collating this data for almost six years now, and so it's taken a long time to build up the sources to go to. Um, but we have a research team that will look for those sources, you know, whether they are you know, um, something online that we can get to, or some relationships that we can um, uh, can get with the core developers or with investors or people who may be in the know. And then we'll automate. And so we'll be automatically checking those um, sources going forward, and then we'll curate a little bit of curation to make sure that there's not noise in, in the data that we have, and, and then we publish uh, from there. Okay, amazing. And you, that's not at 400 millisecond no. <laughs> up time, so how often do those things kind of things get, get out? You're doing this for a thousand securities, right? Or sorry, a thousand crypto assets. So we, we have this data and, and we publish it typically on a like hourly or daily basis, depending on the type of event. So when we think about the Ethereum merge, for example, um, we were hourly updating it as, as it became, you know, was in motion. And then, you know, once we knew kind of when that was going to happen, uh, we, we had that, that published. And, and of course, that, you know, doesn't need to change until, you know, perhaps the deadline changes or the block changes, yeah. uh, block height changes. And so... That, that's the sort of way it, it happens. They don't you know, constantly get updated, but, but as they change, then we try to update them on kind of an hourly basis. And you were saying earlier, uh, which I couldn't believe, that it's actually going to be easier, you think, you perceive, that it's actually going to be easier for you to consume that data through an oracle than it would be to go through your standard process uh, that you've been doing all these yeah. years. Yeah, and again, like when you're looking at traditional corporate actions, you need multiple sources. So we, as a company, would have to go source it from provider A, B, and C before I would ever get through my governance process in order to incorporate that data into an index design. So um, I would much rather go to an oracle where there's tons of node operators who have contributed data, and then I have my single source instead of having to go to everyone and then reconcile between them all. And I think it's kind of a standards thing, like an oracle exposes an interface that you know, people can consistently understand. Right. Otherwise, you're getting your data from like the two big data vendors in traditional finance, Bloomberg and, and Refinitiv. You're going to build adapters to their pipes. If they don't have the data, you're going to have to go to some other vendor, build adapters yep. to their pipes, and on and on and on. And all the big banks and all the traditional hedge funds and financial institutions have teams of people who just spend time building adapters into these mm -hmm. data vendors. 
if you can sort of standardize the way that data is presented, um, have it on an oracle, yeah. easier for people to copy the same pattern. So is it safe to say that large companies, large banks are kind of all in? I mean, you obviously have a lot of clients. So you have a lot of consumers of the index data, a lot of consumers. I mean, it's, if there's any, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no hiding, right? This is, this is real. This is something people might not want to talk about it frequently, but everybody is consuming this data. Everybody needs this data. The demand for your products, I'm guessing, is quite high. The demand for our products has go gone up month over month in spite of what the crypto markets are. We, we right now have, have probably two or three times what we had just three or four months ago in terms of demand. I, I think what's happening in these large institutions is they may not be talking about it publicly, but behind the scenes, and we know because we're interacting, they've got teams who are working on integrating um, public blockchains, um, consuming data from oracles, understanding smart contracts, how to build them. And we see a future where instead of you know, building these brittle internal proprietary systems or risk management, portfolio management, risk measurement, all the derivatives trading, et cetera, they're going to go to the, the primitives in, in, um, in DeFi and smart contracts, and some analyst at the bank is going to build a smart contract in an afternoon because of all the tools that are available in DeFi to achieve something that may have taken weeks or months or years uh, to build out in, in kind of traditional uh, internal systems. And your demand is still growing despite the slowdown? Oh yeah, definitely. So it's not a slowdown, I guess? It's not really... at all. And it just, again, it's like, it's a plumbing issue, right? So our clients have been taking a long time figuring out how do we do this internally? How do they build like portfolio trading systems around everything? Yeah. Um, so that, that's been going on for years behind the scenes. Um, so I think you're, you're just going to see more and more. More and more indexes coming online, more and more exciting products you're going to announce? Yeah, so there's one other thing that you know I love to, love to talk about. Um, if you just kind of think about where is the world moving to, um, most of my indices are uh, rebalanced on a quarterly or monthly basis. We do have some daily rebalancing, but with crypto, you can do things intraday, and you wouldn't do that unless you had intraday information that people were very interested in. And then there was a session earlier today just talking about yield, and, you know, Doug's team has intraday yield numbers, so I could build an index that rebounces intraday and optimizes to where can I pick up the best yield. It only works if there's functionality where someone can trade on that too, but like this is where we're going. It's going to take a while to get there. But... I, I'm willing to wait until January. I'll give you <laughs> until January and then we're good to go. But it's exciting. So I know that everyone is gathering for the exciting finale of our week here, our day. So we're gonna we're gonna let you go. But before we let them, please give them a big hand for joining us and teaching us a little bit.